Welcome to the Joyful Mud Puddles podcast, support you can count on in your parenting journey. Today, I am thrilled to have Heather Boyd with us. Heather Boyd is a private practice occupational therapist from Niagara, Ontario, and mother to three boys. Yay, another boy mom. <laughs> she has nearly 20 years of experience in family-centered infant development. Heather provides virtual consulting to families who are concerned about infant sleep, parenting, child development, and environmental health. She takes an attachment-based approach to supporting families and helps parents increase their knowledge and change their perspective rather than change the nature of their child. Focusing on attachment theory and neurodevelopment, Heather de created the Infant Development Circle, a supportive workshop series that empowers mothers to enjoy and nurture their baby's development by exploring both what development looks like and how to use secure attachment and curiosity to support it. Through this series and through her one-on-one -on -one work, Heather provides maternal support for the role of mothering and brings attention to the nature of child development and parent confidence. Heather, you are so needed. I love it. Thank you so much for being here. It is a pleasure to be here, Megan. <laughs> so, yeah, sleep is one of those things we all joke about, but it's, it's not elusive. You're telling me that it is possible, and I wish I had known you years ago if you only knew what we had gone through. Well, and I, I come by it honestly because <laughs> I needed help when my little one was a baby too, and I, I was an OT. I'd already been an OT for uh, 10 years, and I had no none of the right support for sleep. So I am the sleep consultant that I wish I had when I was a new mom. Isn't that always, that's the same way with me. I'm like, I'm the parenting coach. I wish someone had done for me, like I needed myself. <laughs> so, yeah, I, tell us, so tell us, how did you get started with all of this? Tell us more wow. about yourself than yeah. just you. Well, and you know, as an OT and you know, I'm, I'm in a profession where a lot of people don't understand what occupational therapy is. And if they do, they still don't know what I do because I don't do conventional occupational therapy. Um, but when I decided to open a private practice, I had 15 years of experience in infant development. I'd worked at the neonatal follow-up clinic at Trillium Health Center and at McMaster Children's Hospital. I'd worked in infant development on living room floors throughout Peel for years. And I thought, okay, I have a set of skills that I would like to offer, but I have no idea what this looks like privately. Um, and then I ran a free drop-in on sleep and a dozen families came. And I thought, of course, like what did I struggle with the most, even as a healthcare professional, even as someone who supports parents, it was sleep. So that started the focus on sleep. And I'd always, um, you know, taken an attachment-based approach and didn't want to use cry it out or conventional sleep training with my kids. And so navigating how to translate what I knew about attachment theory and infant development into helping parents guide not just their baby's sleep, but really a paradigm shift in parenting and their thinking around sleep by understanding their child better was really ended up being the, the main focus of what I do. And so then it became most of the focus, but I've, I'm excitedly able to pull in more of what I know about infant development by offering the circle now too. So tell us more about the circle. What does that look like? Right. Well, before COVID-19, it was an in-person group in Niagara, but we quickly navigated and changed to an online format. It really is a cross-section of knowledge and information about infant development, what it is, what activities to do to support it, but also a community for moms, primarily moms, um, who are looking for stories that resonate with them from other parents. Um, talking about the worry of thinking that you're not doing enough to support development or that if you don't buy this toy or provide this kind of enriching environment that somehow your kids are not going to be faster, smarter, or better, which tends to be the message that we get as parents is that we are responsible for making our kids everything that they're going to be. And instead, this group gives enough information for parents to be able to take it and know that they have some framework 
and guidance of what to do during the day, but also lots of support and context and change of perspective around us being the container for our kids, not necessarily the pusher or teacher, but the, the guider, the leader in your family to support your baby. So it's, it's a group I love. I've run it three times now. And what's most exciting is that cross-section of the information with the support. Families get the information they need and then get this real nice sense of community with other moms of babies the same age. And it's, it's so fun to do. After so long in infant development, I can finally pull it all together into this group and it's been really rewarding. I love that. I'm finding the same thing, that that community piece is really the heart of what we're doing, bringing people together. Because, I mean, you can, there's books, there's podcasts, there's, you know, the information is out there, but you really need someone to put it into real terms, relate it to you, and then realize that you aren't alone. Yes, no. yes, that there are others with the exact same questions and worries that you're afraid to share because it makes it seem like you don't know what you're doing. The fact is, as parents, getting to know our kids who are as individual and unique as, you know, there's nobody else like them, none of us know what we're doing, not fully. And when we can be in a group where it's safe enough to say that or to say that we're worried about something is really, really powerful. And like you say, there's, there's probably more information out there. In fact, I have no doubt there's more information out there than we know what to do with and there's, than there's ever been in the entire history of humanity. And yet finding the right information and being able to sort through that and cut through the noise of, you know, the information is there, but really it comes down to what are your priorities as a parent? What do you want to focus on in terms of the values and the environment you're providing because that cuts out 95% of the noise and you can focus on the things that matter the most. So what tips would you have for our listeners? I know like you have the whole circle and it's like a whole thing, but is there any key thing that would really help us? I would say, and I'm writing two word keywords down. The first one is simple simplicity that we tend to get wrapped up in thinking that we need to do more and we need to provide more and we need to get the right toy. If we start from a place of simplicity and know that the simpler the environment or the simpler our routine or schedule, then we're able to, again, take out all of that clutter, both in our minds and in the environment to be able to really get to know our kids without all the busyness of thinking that we should be doing um, mom and tot swimming lessons or sign them up for an online opportunity. Those are all wonderful things, but they're not necessary unless they are a wonderful fit for the priorities that you have as a family. So simplicity would be like the, in big flashing neon lights would be the yes. first message. And then the second is instinct. Now it's tricky as a new parent or any, for any of us who are trying to navigate, even my kids who are now five, eight and 10, to trust my instincts in appreciating that I can figure out what they need regardless of what book I'm picking up or regardless of what article I'm reading. If I trust that I can get to know my kids well enough to figure out what's best for them means that I don't have to listen to all that conflicting advice. And I, because I think that was the one thing that came up over and over again with my infant development circle is the information conflicts. There's so much information out there that doesn't, that's complete opposite, either polar opposite or contradicts each other. And if we go back to what do our kids need? What does my gut say my kid needs right now? And how can I provide it? Then again, that instinct can cut out 95% of the noise. And then the answer is a lot easier to see in terms of being able to make decisions. I, that is so, you know what, the principles that you share are even transferable to other areas of our lives. Just keep it simple and trust yourself. And I think that society is always, like you said, they're flashing so much at us and so much conflicting information that yeah. that's really, really helpful. I appreciate that. And I, no I notice when you're talking about instincts, it sounds to me like you're 
tying that back into that attachment theory too. Can you talk more about that for those who don't quite no, haven't heard that term before. What does I that? I would love to. From from my perspective, I take a very biological or evolutionary approach to infant development. And so, whenever I start wondering what is it that my kids need, I always think again back to that simplicity and that very foundation of what has throughout history been the relationship between a parent and their baby. What are the irreducible needs that haven't changed despite our modern lives and the wonderful and wild things that we have available to us? Um, gosh, I, you know, my kids are getting into video games now and I, I think, okay, that's obviously not been around that long. It's still valuable to our family and certainly to my boys. But if we can boil it down to the relationship and the basic parent-child relationship that has not changed at its most fundamental level, despite all the changes in our modern world. So when we look at simplicity and following our instincts, we're really tapping into kind of that old, almost ancestral knowledge, right? That we have, now this is veering a little off of, of attachment theory per se, but it can be helpful to think of it this way, at least for me, that you know our grandparents and our great grandparents, our great great grandparents, all had the same fundamental irreducible needs to have safety, and security to have a primary caregiver whose face lights up when they see their child um, to help babies get what they need from their environment which is again that safety and security piece and that requires our presence not just physically but actually attending to our babies or children and paying attention to them and what their needs are um, and at, again, at that fundamental basis, the, you know, the little bird that tends to chirp in our ear these days is that we're giving our kids too much, too much love, too much attention, too much coddling. But if we go back to what is a secure attachment, it's not about coddling or giving too much. It's about providing what humans have always needed, which is safety and security and a loving caregiver who loves them unconditionally. And so from an attachment perspective, that secure attachment that allows babies to feel safe is what allows them to fall asleep because sleep is vulnerable, um, but also to explore their environment, to crawl away or move away from parents to explore something because they feel safe enough knowing that their parent is still there to return to for a hug or for a glance or for eye contact or a smile. And so really, I mean, I could talk about this for hours, but at, at its fundamental basis, it's helping give babies that irreducible need of safety and security and love. And so what are some practical things they can do? One you mentioned already is actually be present. So, I mean, putting down the phone, focusing on your child, but what are some other just simple things that we can do to work on those relationships one thing that comes to mind with that question is there, there's a program that we used to use at the infant development um, program that i was in it was called watch wait and wonder and it was designed to help parents develop more of a um, watchful and curious approach to their kids so i would say from a practical point of view this isn't an activity to do or a toy to provide but is a mindset shift that's very practical and very simple and it's to have curiosity. So instead of trying to teach your child and to make them do something or make them be something, watch with curiosity about what your child is doing or trying to do, um, how frustrated they are with it, and are they figuring it out or is this when we give a helping hand? What kind of temperament or personality do they have and how does that guide what kind of support you do give them? You know, I have three boys, as do you, and all three of them have such different personalities that whenever things are getting a little bit wild or mixed up, I think, just stop and think, like, what do each of them as individuals need from me to get through this conflict or to get through this worry or to get through the boredom or the whatever we're trying to do that day? And even as babies, although we don't know them well yet, their personalities are only just emerging, if we can slow down and just be curious, just be curious and watch, then I think that that is something that will apply from birth right up through adulthood in terms of our parenting. 
that makes so much sense. And I really, really appreciate that it's not just another activity, another tool, another thing to go by. It's that mindset shift that you can carry on throughout their whole life. Mm -hmm. Because you really, you want to get to know a person, then you need to get to know them, right? Yeah, and and need spend to pay time attention. with them and play and, and help them. And I like also that you were mentioning that it's not about us pushing or, or putting it on them. It's let them develop, let them be curious and, you know, learn in their own way. Yeah. I used to work, my mentor and first boss when I was an OT was a physio OT who was phenomenal. And she always said, no matter how good a physiotherapist is, they're never going to make a kid walk that wasn't going to walk. So let's just look more at the quality of the environment and the interaction so that walking is something and you could replace that with anything, talking, um, you know, venturing out to meet a friend or, uh, you know, or even just take the bravery of, um, you know, at, for a very young child playing with someone in a play group that they've never met before. And if we, you know, look at that as being something that we're simply guiding and supporting rather than making happen, then that, I mean, that for me as a parent lifts the weight off my shoulders as being solely responsible for everything that my child decides to do or chooses to do or becomes that I am merely, I, oh, I don't want to say merely, that makes it sound like it's not like the most important job I have, but I am, I am supporting and guiding them. I'm not making them, I'm not forming them. I'm providing what they need to form themselves, I guess, over time. Boy, we're getting philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> That's not very practical at all, is it? <laughs> but it is that mindset shift because even in, in the work that I do with parents, they all come for their kids. They want something fixed. So parents will come to you and they want the sleep fixed. And that's the traditional approach is to, to fix the problem and, you know, put that band-aid solution. But we're talking a whole mindset shift. And parenting yeah. really is about 90% the parent. It's all you and how you approach it. It's not yeah. the kid. They just no, merely respond no. to how you are parenting them. So, and yes, that applies to yeah. sleep as well. It does. And with sleep, you know, I, parents, you know, I always make sure to make sure parents are a good fit for what I'm providing because I don't have any magic wand. I don't um, solve sleep in three days. But what I do tell them is that if there is something getting in the way, like reflux or environmental allergies or whatever it is, we, we can fix that. We can move that boulder out of the way. But the rest of it is looking at what's, typical development and how can we understand normal development enough to realize that we can actually rest in what's happening instead of fighting so hard against nature that we don't need to make our children sleep well if we've removed those barriers to sleep we can simply understand sleep well enough to support where sleep is at for them at this moment um, and that that ability to rest in where our children are at right now rather than fight it saves so much energy and so much um, conflict in our own minds about our failure to solve a sleep challenge or failure to have our children walk when the textbook says they should walk. And that, that really does go all the way through. It applies to homeschooling. It applies to moving away to go to college. Like it just, it's, I always tell parents too that, you know, if I'm doing my job well, you're coming to me for sleep, but we're talking about the whole spectrum of development and you'll leave with tools that apply well beyond this problem. Like you'll have problem solving tools, not just strategies that fit for this week. It really is that mindset shift so that you have the tools to solve challenges moving forward. You mentioned, um, more than once about environment and i know that's another component of the work that you do did you want to tell us a bit about that sure like the envir environmental health piece or environment in general whatever <laughs> okay i'll start with environment in general. whatever whatever you just wanted <laughs> to share with us i know yeah. that that i don't know if that's like a separate podcast episode and i'll have you on <laughs> again be. but um <laughs> I personally, I know your story, so, but I know that um, 
on your website, it does mention that environmental. Yeah, culture. yeah. Be part of what you, know, you do. Environment, you know, we can look at the parenting environment, which is obviously integral to everything that we do with our kids so that the emotional energy we bring and the you know the pressure that we have or whether we're we're well well rested enough to be good parents but the physical environment is another piece and it's that's more around you know where is baby sleeping and what are parents comfort level with being creative and open-minded about setting up an environment that meets the emotional needs of their baby but then the third Part of that is the biological environment. So looking at indoor air quality, water damage, mold, all of which impact sleep and impact um, emotions, um, impact behavior. So, you know, taking a look, and that, that would be a whole podcast on its own, I think. Um, but yeah, you know, our family experienced health issues related to water damaged environment. And so I'm very much aware of the impact that our environment, even if it's not something we can see or smell, can have an impact on sleep and development and parenting. So it's something that I think is a scary topic for a lot of people, particularly when I know what the percentage is in terms of houses that have um, a challenging indoor environment in terms of indoor air quality. It's also, you know, I, I like comparing it to trying to buy a car or find a good mechanic that you know there is so much information you would need to know to be, to understand it well enough to make decisions. And so you need to defer to someone who knows it well enough to guide you, but who you also trust because they're just like with anything with parenting, there's differing opinions and there's differing approaches. Um, and there tends to be, from my professional experience, a temptation to dismiss people's personal experiences around indoor air quality. That parents may feel like something isn't right. Again, that's trusting those instincts, right? And yet they can't find someone that's going to listen to their story and to understand that they're worried about this. And it's not just that they're worried about the environment, but then you have worry and information seeking and trying to find the right information on top of that. And that just makes it this big heap of like dirty laundry that we're trying to sort through and we need someone to help. <laughs> and we're so thankful that you are there to help us because that is something that isn't really talked about except when it's, you know, one of those media scares and then everyone panics and, you know, yeah. but it is something that we need to take into account all the different factors. And that's mm -hmm. another factor that you might not have considered. So I'm so mm -hmm. thankful that you're there to just make that people aware of it. So yes, yeah. is there anything else you wanted to share with us about what you do or anything coming up? You have a new mm. Facebook group? Oh, I do. And I'm, do. I fought it for so long. I didn't want to start a group. I wasn't sure how much energy it was going to take. Um, but I'm so glad I did because unlike my Facebook page, there's interaction. There's people are able to share and ask questions and get support from each other. And it's, I mean, it's only a few days old and I'm already really excited about what's happening there. It's the family sleep and development group on Facebook. And I'm actually running a toddler. Um, I'm going to be running some regular um, events on there from birth to toddlerhood around sleep and development and a little bit about environment thrown in there. Um, just enough that it's on people's radar in terms of, again, moving those boulders out of the way so that development can happen. Excellent. And we'll make sure we have links to how we can connect with you. Where can we find you on, on the internet there? I'm at heatherboyd.ca um, and that, that gives you most of the links that lead me to where people would need to go to connect with me. Um, but I'm also on Facebook at heatherboyd, comma, OT, I think, or it's heatherboyd.ot, I guess, in terms of the URL. And uh, yeah, I, I am also on Instagram, but I am not the most tech savvy and I I think my handle is heatherboyd.ot, but I'm not well, sure. We'll make sure those links are there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Heather, thank you so much for joining us. I truly appreciate having you here. It's been a lot of fun. It's been great. And I'm just, I, it's, I'm so glad that you're doing this podcast in general because 
when I look at, you know, just the parallels between, you know, early infancy and the sleep piece for parents, and then the uncertainty, especially these days around schooling and unschooling and homeschooling, that, you know, again, parent, there's so much information out there, and it's helping parents connect with the information that's going to help simplify it for them and to take the scariness out of the decisions that they're making right now. So I'm glad you're here too. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who are enjoying this podcast, if you would please consider leaving a review, make sure you subscribe. That just helps get this podcast out so that more people can hear about it and join in the community. So be sure to leave a rating and a review and spread the word so that more people can join in the podcast um, of jo Joyful Mud Puddles podcast community. Take care and have a joyful day. Okay.